And welcome back, fourth and long fans. It's your footy correspondent, Coach Donnie Hess, here back with another AFLW round review. Round one is in the books. Her story has been made as all 18 clubs have played their first game in the AFLW. But before we get into that, I want to introduce my co-host, a great fan and great friend of the podcast, the USAFL media manager, Mr. Brian Barris. Brian, how are you doing? Uh, good day, Donnie. Good day, everybody. I'm doing absolutely splendid. That's like deja vu all over again. We just finished the AFL's W season and just like uh, the coming of spring or summer or whatever this is down there, here's another season. So I'm excited and I'm excited that all 18, as a Hawthorne supporter, as I know you, Donnie, as a Swan supporter, are glad that we finally have a barracking interest. I won't say the R word. We have a barracking interest in <laughs> in in, uh, in in AFLW now. Yeah, so we unfortunately the snap of the fingers and the girls are back on to the field. But you want to know what? I think it's absolutely fantastic. And I thought the footy was absolutely great. Brian, really quick, before we go into the game reviews, thoughts on round one? Because personally, I thought it was competitive. I thought it was great. I know some people were worried of the dilution of a talent, but honestly, I think most of the games were quite talented. Yes, we had a couple of games that got a little out of hand, but in all, I was pretty happy with nine very good quality games of footy. Yeah, I, I think you hit it on the head, Donnie. I think that uh, there's there's going to be room for improvement for some teams, and then we know that some teams were missing players through injury and and uh, you know in the lead up to this to this season. But I think all in all, I think just about every team can be can be happy uh, with with the by and large of their performance. Um, you know, there's going to be room for improvement with a couple of teams. You know, and they're and they're going to you know they. In, in some cases, and we'll talk about, you know, let's say, uh, you know, Fremantle, <coughs> excuse me, losing big to to Brisbane. It's a bit of a punch in the gut to start the season. On one hand, there's nine games left in this season, but on the other hand, there's only nine games left in the season. So I think it's set up the rest of the year to be very intriguing, especially when you look at the four new teams. And we'll talk about that in, in just a moment. Yeah. So let's let's jump right into it. I mean, we get we get the usual opener, Icon at Icon Park as the Collingwood Magpies take on the Blues. Collingwood gets the double up 36 to 18, an 18 point win by the Pies and a great first game that I look at it and go. I was worried that is this going to be a Carlton team that's going to be severely under under woman, shall we say, because of some of the losses that they had in the off season. Yeah, and I, but I think overall they—I mean—they didn't play bad. I mean, they were competitive with with Collingwood for just about the entire way, and they only kept them to two points in the final term. I mean, and, and you know, and, and at the same time, it was also tied at the end of the first quarter. Uh, I mean, Darcy Vessio is is Darcy Vessio. There, mm -hmm. uh, you know, th they played game number fifty. Uh, they're you know still, I think, one of the premier teams in the premier players. In, in the league, I think Bree Moody had a fantastic game. She ended mm -hmm. up getting a goal. Uh, Lucy McAvoy played well. But, I mean, this is a Collingwood team that, you know, is coming back from last year. I think they've got a little bit of a – they their last season, they've, they've still got a little bit of a chip on their shoulder because I think they know they can make a deep run. And, um, you know, some of the players that they played well, I think I'm really been impressed with Ruby Schleiser. Uh, she played particularly well coming through the middle. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how they go. But it, it's – I don't think – this doesn't look like a, a Carlton team last year that I think was just going to be completely out matched yeah i think collingwood was the better team and they deserve the victory but um i think Colin, i think carlton is going to be a lot more competitive this year than they were last year yeah i completely agree with you and the fact that slicer was able to go through the midfield a little bit too i mean and she's always been really consistent off that halfback that rebounding halfback which i think really helps collingwood's kind of running gun game through the corridor a little bit and and having steph kiochi back healthy i think is another thing that was really good for them because her injury, her Achilles injury really kind of hampered it. I mean, I know they lost Bree Davy and then Britt Benici later in the year, and it really kind of roller coastered their season. But uh, Steph Kiyochi is is that solid outside winger. She she gives you good run. She's she's great tackling. So I, I think she she really helped out. And then seeing some of the, the younger young girls, um, Imogen Barnett coming in and playing yeah. playing pretty well. Um, and just in, in all, I think they played really, really well. With with Carlton, I think it was a little bit of they they just they they played well in the first half. In the second half, they kind of had that second half fade, which I, mm -hmm. interesting that several teams had that. It was like, is it is it fully down to the short preseason 
to where it's kind of going to be some skills are going to kind of make up for a lack of fitness for these first few rounds until the girls get fully up to yeah. full season conditioning, which I'll be fascinated to see how that goes um, on that. So we'll jump to Friday night, which I mean, this was the most anticipated game of the entire round. Everybody was talking about it. Friday night footy Melbourne at Glenel Goval after they had to move it from Norwood and uh, the D's keep the streak alive that uh, the, the defending uh, the, the defending premiers cannot find a way to win the rematch. D's 44 crows 26 it may be 18 but honestly this game was a lot more a lot closer than the final score in my personal opinion oh i think so too and melbourne you know i i, I think this is uh you know this is a slightly different adelaide team i mean they're, now they're without it's not even so much that they have you know aaron phillips who of course missed that long long period after doing the acl her acl in the grand final a couple of years ago but it's interesting to kind of see how the dynamic of the team changes without her there now, but they are still a competitive team. They'd still mm -hmm. have all of the players. I mean, they and Hatch are still there. They still have Chelsea Randall, Ash Woodland kicked three goals and she's going to be one to watch this season. I think Stevie Lee Thompson is still there, but, Melbourne is still the Melbourne team and Melbourne is still a very, 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 very good team. And you look at the players that did the, that did the most. I mean, I mean, Taylor Harris, I think now that she's going to try and prove that last season was no fluke and that she is a good player if she's surrounded by a, by a good team. And I think that's the case. Um, you know, uh, Sarah Lampard, good to see her get involved once again and make the mm -hmm. best, um, you know, and, and, and so I, I think it'll, I think Melbourne, this is a very, very flying start for them. I wouldn't get too down if you're Adelaide. I think that, you know, it's going to take a little bit of time, I think, to adjust without that presence of Aaron Phillips there, but, you know, there's, Adelaide is still a good team. I still think they're going to make finals, and and um, you know it didn't really show too many negative. I don't think the the only thing that I could say was is that Adelaide's defense looked a little more frazzled this yeah. time. And and the other thing you got to say though too is is that you got to give the Melbourne coaching staff a lot of kudos because Chelsea Randall has been Taylor Harris's kryptonite every time mm -hmm. she's faced Taylor. Every time Taylor has faced Chelsea Randall, she has not done well. What did they do? They moved her into the rock. They moved her further up the field. They forced Chelsea Randall to make a decision. Do I go up with her into the midfield or do I stay back and play defense? And that got Taylor Harris some more of the footy. And Taylor mm -hmm. Harris did some other things too. She crumbed. She got one of those goals in a crumb where she didn't have to worry about rushing it She with a nice goal there. So um, I, I really enjoyed the way Melbourne played their footy. This was a great game of football. Um, I, again, the score was a, a little bit bigger than I was expecting. Yeah. It, it, it's hard not to argue that these, these two teams and then a team we'll talk about here in just a little bit are, are, are still the three teams that are going to be the measuring sticks this season. They're the three teams everybody's talking about going into this off season. So a great first game. Uh, and I completely agree with you, Adelaide, they're they're not out of the water. This is a first game hiccup because they played a really good team. They just they had one they had one bad game. And when you can take Ebony Marinoff out of the game, she only gets 14 disposals, much lower than she normally does. Yeah. That affected. Ann Hatchard had her great game, which again, Ann Hatchard doing what Ann Hatchard does. She gets a lot of the footy. She she makes a lot of impact. But Ebony Marinoff not getting loose, kind of being constrained a little bit, I think helped Melbourne a lot in this one. And Melbourne just looks so deep, so strong in every level. Um, I, I'm excited to see how they go here. We'll jump to it to the other Friday game as North Melbourne goes up and gets a big win at home, 40 to 14, 26 point lead over a Gold Coast Suns team that unfortunately I worry that some of their losses that they had over this off season really, really showed against a North Melbourne team that they just had enough class in just the right areas that they made this a very easy win for the Ruse. I'm curious as to where they're going to get really their, their dominance in the forward line. Cause when they had Sarah Perkins, at least they had a lightning rod who could take those strong marks. And I don't know that they have that strong presence there. Uh, you know, they got two goals really you know, towards the end of the game when, when they were down, I mean, they were down 40 to 40 to one going into the final, uh, final term. And, you know, by that time, North Melbourne had salted the game away. So yeah, I'm, I, I think it's going to be a long, long season for them. 
I don't I don't know that they will be competitive as they were last year where they were challenging to for the final spot right at the end. But North Melbourne, I mean, this is the game, you know, you come into a game like this and you put your stranglehold on the on the on the competition right from the outset. And, you know, uh, Talia Randall kicking three goals. Jazzy Gardner had a really good game. Emma Kearney was Emma Kearney. Emma King did a fantastic job in the ruck as she always did. You know, North Melbourne is, I I feel like the fact that they won this game easily, yeah, it's what they were supposed to do. It'll be interesting to see later on in the season when they start playing some tougher opposition. But, you know, you always want to start at home with a win. And, you know, listen, there's been a lot of talk and I don't know, I don't know how much we'll get into it, but, you know, they've got a home game coming up that's been moved. Uh, you know, Dottie and I were talking about this before we came on air and we were using loud voices uh, to, 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 you know, to, to kind of express our, our uh, opposition at the fact that North will be playing a home, you know, a, a home game as part of a curtain raiser to a men's finals game. But um I mean, getting back to the game, I think I think this is a straightforward victory for North Melbourne, and we'll, but I'm I'm keen to see how they do later on in the season against tougher competition. Yeah, me too. I, this this in fact this upcoming week is is quite is quite the little test. We kind of see is this a little bit of fool's gold a little bit for North Melbourne? Did they capitalize on a a weakened team? That I I agree with you. I think Sarah Perkins' loss I think really kind of exposed. Um, a weakness when it comes to depth in, in the forward line. I mean, Tara Bohan is there, but I think Tara Bohan had capitalized a lot last year on the fact that she had Sarah Perkins in, on, on on the park with her that I think now Tara Bohan is going to have a little bit more, a little bit of a harder time trying to get open in that Gold Coast forward line. So we jump out west and we get our first, the first of our new expansion teams as the Port Adelaide Power go out to Mineral Resources Park and the West Coast Eagles and the Eagles, a brand new Eagles team that had so many additions, finds a way to get it done, 40 to 28, a 12 point lead. And unfortunately, a very well, as we kind of stated in the first game, it's the fourth quarter fade as Port Adelaide played really well for three quarters. And that fourth quarter, it just got away from them. So uh, thoughts on this one. This this is uh, this is not your father's uh, West Coast a- AFLW team. Uh, and by fathers, I mean, you know, March of 2022. I mean, they've gone from being a a you know a a team that was I think considered an easy beats, and you also you kind of questioned <clears throat> what the West Coast Eagles were thinking about uh, in terms of how what their direction was uh, in terms of in terms of building an AFLW team, but. I mean, this was a character building win. They were up, uh, you know, they were up by two goals at quarter time. Port Adelaide tied it at halftime. They were up by uh, just under two goals at three quarter time. And West Coast kicks four in the final term to win the game. And uh, what a what a fantastic goal by uh, by McCarthy, uh, by uh, by Aisling McCarthy, the Irish, the Irish woman. It, it's amazing some of the some of the talent they've picked up. Of course, the big story here is the loss of Kelly Gibson, uh, who is out for the season with the knee, and it's a huge, huge loss for this team. Um, so their depth, I think, is going to come into play here. Um, you know, they they went up against a Port Adelaide team that uh, Port, I think, a lot of buzz about about how they would do, and you know, I I I think had I looked at this maybe last year, I think if this was this year's Port Adelaide team against West Coast last team, I think Port Adelaide mm-hmm. probably wins this game. But this is a much improved West Coast Eagles side. And I'm really I'm really kind of interested to see how they do, especially vis-a-vis the Dockers. And we'll get to them in just a moment. But this is a huge, huge win for the Eagles side. And especially a lot of those returning players from last season, it has to be a confidence booster. Yeah, definitely. And, and I think, again, it was the West Coast Eagles, the, their their experience, and then getting some of, the, some of their better players to have a great, like you said, Aisling McCarthy having an absolutely fantastic game there. Emma Swanson having 21 disposals. I oh, think, yeah. Was an incre- was an incredible game there. So they, and they just, and, and, um, was it Jessica? I think it's Jessica Sedinary, Um, having such a great game down yeah. back. She had so many great intercept marks that kind of stomped some of the Port Adelaide's uh, push up into that. So just, it, just a, a well-played game by the West Coast Eagles. I agree. I'm interested to see how they go against 
some of the more veteran teams in this league. But um, there, there's there's some positive things to look at when it comes to out in the West, especially now that unfortunately it looks like Fremantle may be a little bit vulnerable over these next few weeks. We jump up to North Sydney Oval, where I, I mean I had my eyeballs all over this one as, as my beloved Swans take on took on the Saint killed the Saints at North Sydney Oval, eight thousand two hundred people made it out. It was an incredible. It was a smaller oval, but it was packed. It was great. Unfortunately, the Swans fall just a tiny bit short to the Saints, 56-27, a 29-point win by the Saints. But at, speaking as a Swan supporter, I'll put on my red hat for just the tiniest bit. I saw a lot of positive things by the Swans team. So many great performances. The tiny scare of Montana Ham going down. Thankfully, it's not an ACL. It's only, unfortunately, we will miss her for three to four weeks in the Swans colors. But the one thing I got to give is there was compete, there was tackling pressure, and there was never give up. And the Swans fans stayed and they stayed in this game. I see a lot of positives. I see some great performances by some young debutante players that I think can have very good AFLW careers. I will put my regular hat on. Kate Shelor, incredible game. Incredible game. Kick yeah. the goals. Uh, I think that tree behind the one goal is is kind of is is gonna be super happy that Kate Sheelor is gone because she beat that tree up every time she kicked a goal that way. I thought it was fascinating. Um, I think we need a goal behind mo I think we need a tree behind most goals. I thought that was fascinating on that. This St. Kilda team is definitely much better. Georgia Patricios is back in. You can tell her her silk and her class with the footy. They they had some some great performances. Uh, I know one of their one of their one of their Irish girls in the back had several intercept marks that really helped them bounce off, especially late in the game. Um, Clara Fitzpatrick, um, she had a, yeah. several several really good uh, intercept disposals, which helped get kind of St. Kilda going back the other way and counterattacking a lot. So uh, a lot of great things to see for the Saints. I'm hoping that, that it continues. I, I, I saw a lot of good things. Again, is it a little bit of playing a 10-week together team, a, an expansion team? Did they capitalize on it? Will we, will we get more of a reality check when they play teams like the Western Bulldogs, the GWS Giants, the the – the Brisbane Lions, the West Coast Eagles, we'll have to see. But um, in all, again, Sydney Donnie, super excited. I know it was a loss, but I, I saw a lot of positive things. I, I I could not lower my head. I thought the girls played really well. St. Kilda, incredible game, well deserved victory. Yeah, you, you. I think I think you're absolutely right on both counts. I think Sydney, you know, and there's a lot of promise there. And there's, as you mentioned, there's a lot of young talent. But then you have, you know, the the prospect of Brooke Lockland in there, and and showing, you know, why she was such a big pickup for this for the Sydney team. Mm -hmm. And and you know, like you said, <clears throat> this is, a, I mean, it's an expansion team. At the end of the day, even with all the players that have come up, especially with so many teams coming into the league with four teams coming in and talent scattering. Yeah. It's going to take, it's, it's not going to, it's not going to, it's not going to hit the ground running St. Kilda. I mean, here's another situation. I, it's the same situation with West coast. You come in thinking, well, even against an expansion team, this is, if this is last season, St. Kilda, they're going to get run off the park. And I know if you've listened to the show, me on the show last year, you know that I lambasted Nick Del Santo as a coach. Mm -hmm. You know that I that I completely didn't don't think he should be coaching at this level, at least not not in elite women's competition. I mean, hats off to him. I mean, whatever he did, he did a fantastic game plan and it yielded eight goals from from a, a, against the team that again. You know, I think a lot of people were expecting to be very competitive. And and you said Sydney is being competitive. Kate Sherlor has always been, I think, a very, very she's been an above average and a good solid footballer. I think the question has been, you know, what is the team around her? And the fact that she scored four goals in this sort of in this sort of game, I think is going to give her a lot of confidence. She's very talented. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned Patricios, Aaron McKinnon coming across from GWS, uh, doing a playing very well, um, you know, so. Uh, but but I, I think the biggest I think the biggest good thing from St. Kilda for Sydney, I think, like you said, is Montana ham. I think I think in a in a situation where when somebody goes down with the knee, there's almost this expectation that that there is a that that they're gone for the season. I think that 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 has to be at least one positive out of this is that they're not going to lose her for too long. But 
I mean, St. Kilda with a big win. We'll see how they do in the coming weeks, like you said. I mean, not every team is going to be when, an expansion team, but I think that that you can't ask for a better start out of the season for Nick Del Santo and crew. Yeah, and, and Nick and Nicholas Stevens, who came over from Saint, from yes. uh, Carlton and Nicholas and Nicholas Zenos, both with incredible games too. Got got to yeah. give them shout outs. I think they played yep. really really well. So. I thought it was it was a great game and and that oval at North Sydney Oval I thought was absolutely fantastic. It may have been a smaller oval, it may have been a skinny oval, but it, it a lot of fans raved about how how good the footy was on that and to see all the fans there absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Um. So so absolutely great here. So we'll, we'll move to the other the two expansion teams playing each other, which I thought was absolutely fantastic because they got it moved to Marvel and over twelve thousand showed up your beloved hawks played the essendon bombers the old rivals yes it's in the men's will it will it go there was there was some stick in this game i gotta give it yeah. there was some stick in this game i loved it i love seeing the back and forth between it essendon get the chalkies by 26 53 27 an incredible game and it did lead to a lot of conversations about should we start playing more of these women's games in these bigger stadiums where they don't have to worry about wind. They don't have to worry as much about the weather because look at the footy we were given to two expansion teams, getting up and down the field, putting in some goals, 53 points scored by an Essendon team. And the scary part is it probably could have been more if they were just a little bit more accurate. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the other, and the thing is as well, is that, is that uh, imagine if they would have been playing 20 minutes and with time on like the men and not this 15 minutes nonsense, but which mm. is which is besides the point. I, I want to bring up two, you know, and, and you know, I, I think Essendon, you know, I mean, you see Bonnie too good. I mean, come on. The fact that they were able to, to get her from the Bulldogs is fantastic. Uh, that was a coup, in my opinion. That yeah, was a coup. So that, was, was, that was one of Georgia G, Maddie Persparkis. I kind of expected yeah. I'd heard talk. She was the wild card of the Essendon pickups that I think was absolutely fantastic. I was gutted for the doggies to lose her. But yeah. the fact that she came over gives that marquee forward to Essendon. And I thought that was fantastic. And she balled out in this game. She played really well. There's two players on the Essendon team that have actually, you know, Hawthorne and Essendon are rivals, but this Hawthorne supporter really wants to see the Bombers do well for two reasons. And that is Danielle Marshall mm -hmm. and Jessica Wuchner. Now, for those of you not aware, they both played in the USAFL at one time. Now, now Wusha is from Tasmania originally, and in 2015, uh, she reached out to the USAFL. And of course, this was two years. This was still during. This was two years before AFLW started. This was still during the exhibition years of that. The you know the AFL was having that Melbourne versus Bulldogs, and she she uh, reached out to us. She ended up playing for in Boston for three months. Um, took a Boston Lady Demons side that was fledgling and unfortunately sad to say it kind of in Wusha's wake has really struggled numbers wise but um, I think when we saw her play I mean it was absolutely fantastic she goes to Brisbane she uh, helps them win a, a, a title uh, just a year or so after that incident where she was struck by lightning while she was out working. All the uh, all the, the struggles that she had had, she's been very open with mental health awareness and everything. Uh, she comes back. She helps the Lions win the grand final last year. She doesn't play much of a part last season, and she's unceremoniously delisted by the lions by she was a charter member of the lions in 2017 and i think there was I, I i feel like there was a little bit of acrimony there maybe on on wusha's side just simply because i don't think she was really given a fair shake and i think just as an outside observer i would have tend to have to agree with that she ends up with essendon she kicks a goal in the first quarter then we have danny marshall Learned the game in 2009. Everybody knows the story. Learned it when she was playing NCAA soccer. Couldn't really try it because she was under a uh, a uh, uh, scholarship, so she couldn't really do anything outside of what she had the scholarship for. Ten years later, she's playing for the Arizona Hawks. She ends up with a tryout in the AFLW, gets signed by the Western Bulldogs, plays in their first season, kicks a first kicks a goal, first goal of the game really kind of fades from her from their game plan under Nathan Burke, which I will again say not terribly high on on how she was treated by Nathan Burke. My my opinion from an outside uh, perspective, she gets delisted at the end of 2021, goes to the Bombers, 
gets converted into a fullback, helps them win, go undefeated, and they win the VFLW competition going undefeated. She comes into this game. She gets named into the best. And when they gave her a spell in the half forward line, not only did she take a nice mark, she roosted one from 40 meters out. When people tell me, oh, women can't kick more than 10 meters, I'll show you that. And she kicked it on the fly. Those two players, the fact that they had come back, that they kicked a goal in the game and were a, a very important part, I think, very, very good redemption stories. And that is what one of the reasons I love this team and want to see Essendon do well. But also I like this competition in general. Yeah, one hundred percent agree. And then and we can't we can't not talk about it. Sophie Locke no. of the of the Hawthorne Hawks. You gotta I, I gotta say special shout out to her, that young lady to to do everything that she has under the issues of losing her mother just weeks prior to the season starting the awesome video that Beck Goddard and the Hawthorne Hawks put out about finding out that she makes it. And what does she do? She kicks the first goal on in Hawthorne history and is able to, to commemorate her mother by kissing the second arm band and pointing to the sky. Absolutely tear jerking yeah. moment for me. I am not afraid to say that it, it brought a tear to my eye. It was a tear of joy. I'm happy that she did so well. So, uh, uh, Sophie Locke, congratulations. Have a great AFLW career, young lady. You did a very, yeah. very good job there. So, but, it, but I, I got to say it. This was a great game. This is a great game of footy back and forth. Absolutely fantastic. And a Again, little bit of heat, like you said. Exactly. And two, and two expansion teams that got after each other. So we'll have to see. Can Essendon bounce back this week? They got a little bit of a tougher test this round. How does Hawthorne back up their first game? Their first game? How do they bounce back from that? So we'll have to see. But it's just an incredible, incredible stories on both sides. So thank you for bringing that up. If you didn't, I was going to, I was definitely going to bring up Danny and Jess's connection to the USAFL, especially with us being USAFL uh, uh, current members of USAFL teams. So we jumped to the Doggies and the Giants, a very intriguing game here because a lot of people are talking about these are two of the teams that are in that discussion for this final two final spots as this year goes on. So really quickly, Doggies get the win by seven, a cracking competitive game between the Dogs and the Giants. What, and and what what talent on both sides? I mean, I look at some of the goal kickers. You know, Bree Moody kicking a couple, Newton kicking a couple, Kirsty Lamb in there. How about Rocky Cranston? Mm -hmm. She's not done by any stretch of the that imagination. Goal, that goal what? was insane. It had eyes. <laughs> it really, it really <laughs> it did. It, it was. It, it 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 was like a it was like a, a it was like a slug trying to find its way back home, getting away from a giant shaker of salt. But it, it was, I mean, but then. What about Cora Staunton for GWS? I mean, Cora Staunton is is older than me, and I can barely walk down the street without me taking a breath. And she's Absolute out here legend. kicking three goals. She really is. So there's there's a lot of good talent. I mean, Alicia Evit is still good. I've really liked seeing Tate McCrill come come to the fore, and she's played extremely well over the last couple of years. I she think had she's a got burn a lot to her go. bonnet. She had a burn her bonnet with with Ellie Blackburn. Oh, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> that was but, that got spicy too. You had, you, you got to give Tate Mackerel this. She didn't, she didn't back down, and Ellie and, and Ellie Blackburn didn't either. So I mean, and, and that's that's a couple of that's a couple of different categories, shall we say, when it when it comes to size. So uh, you got to give it. But I loved the spiciness. I like first game of the year. They know the importance. You got to get off to a big win. So GWS again, this they're this team that new coach, new style. Let's see how it goes. And it. it Though they didn't get the win, they only lost by seven. There's a lot of positives to see out of this team because a lot mm -hmm. of that talent showed why this this team could do so much better than they kind of have been these last couple of seasons, kind of mired back mid pack to lower part of the of the AFLW table. Yeah, they they really have. I mean, we'll we'll have to see. I mean, they're really. I think I think now you know going forward. And uh, you know it's not going to get any easier. They got to host Brisbane next week, so I think mm -hmm. this is this is. I mean, it's going to be very interesting to see how they kind of recover from this. But I just, I mean, I I think the Bulldogs. I think they needed this win, and I think that they are. You know, they're they're a cusp team, and I feel mm -hmm. like the entire. You know, ever since they've you know probably the last three or four seasons, they've always been that team kind of on the cusp. I mean, in 2020, I think they were. You know, they started out really well. 
with that one victory and then they dropped like a rock the last season they were really kind of on the cut they all of a sudden they kind of came out of nowhere to challenge and then they well, kind I of think dropped. The, i think the covid striking them earlier in the year really really hammered yeah. them. if if I, and i've said it to a few people if they don't have the covid issue to where they have those two games having to be rescheduled I think it's the doggies in the finals instead of Collingwood because I think they I think if they don't have the issues they did they beat GWS in that one game that you could tell the doggies were out in their feet mid third quarter and GWS won that game if you change that if you change that to a regular doggies performance the doggies probably win I think the dogs make the finals instead of Collingwood last year so it, it, a missed opportunity last year it, it, and it wasn't of anything that they could really control yeah I mean it's <sighs> It was sort of like the way I felt like is if you were playing D and D last year and it's like you rolled a D twenty and it's like, oh, and this week it's the Western Bulldogs who have COVID and it's six players who are affected. I mean, it it was <laughs> it was really difficult, I think, to kind of deal with that. And um, and it hit some teams harder than others. Mm -hmm. But it's a good start. I think I think like I said, I I like I said, I, I still have kind of this little thing against Nathan Burke, but we'll see how it goes the rest of the season. I think if they can get them into the finals, I think, you know, some of that will be, I think, I think some of that will be forgiven. Yeah, I, I completely agree there. We, we jumped to it to probably the most lopsided score, but honestly, I think it was lopsided because Fremantle just got absolutely, they, they've had so many injuries preseason and they started off really competitive and then they had friendly fire with, with uh, Cuthbertson breaking her nose. So the, the lions win by 49, 76, 27. Again, this lions team, they are, they are sneakily, they are sneaky, scary, good when they want to be, especially with the, with the three or four headed monster of Wardlore, Greta Bodie, Chelsea Hodder, mm -hmm up front i mean who, what poison do you take what what poison do you take because you're going to get burned by one of them orla oh bloody dwyer with <laughs> two more goals i mean from the midfield from the midfield i mean i mean it's it's fantastic it's fantastic to kind of see how they go and and you know what i mean it's a it's a brisbane team that that again is very very good and unfortunately they they had uh lily postal weight unfortunately with another acl tear and mm -hmm. that and, and unfortunately i mean she's just been completely snake bit but I mean, again, good teams go into a you know a difficult situation and they pick teams apart. And we saw, you know, I mean, I mean, Rio. I think it's going to be you know, you know they've got Kira Bowers and they've got Miller, but of course they're missing they're missing uh, uh, Carrie Antonio. It's Abby good. Antonio. Yeah, they're missing Abby Antonio. They're yep. missing a number of other players. I mean, it's I mean it's going to be really. I don't know that they're going to be as competitive, which is a shame because they do have a a, a, a buff young players i like watching mulholland play i like watching tide play mm -hmm. uh you know and of course they've got haley miller or as they're called in some circles bailey miller uh <laughs> BAE. um but uh yeah no i i i, I mean I don't think it's, I mean, I think this might be indicative of both seasons. I don't know that Brisbane is going to go around kicking 11 goals all season, but you can tell that their forward line is very deep and very powerful. And if they don't get you the midfield, well, as we mentioned with Orla's two goals. And Emily Bates too, who was last mm -hmm. year, last year's best and fairest. So let, let's jump to it. This, this may have been the lowest scoring. This may have been the lowest scoring, Brian, but damn it. This was the most entertaining game for me. 15, 11 Geelong wins by four. Georgie Prasparkis kicks both of the goals for the for the Cats, but my Christmas Eve was this a physical, tough, hard game of football. I know it was low scoring, but damn it, I was entertained by this one. This was absolutely fantastic footy. You had some great players: Ellie McKenzie, Mon Conti, Georgie Prasparkis, Nina Morrison. OMG, this was a great game. Uh, the score is not indicative of how no. good this game really was. 2005 men's grand final the two teams barely score i think all i think total what it was at 112 points between the two teams and they played 120 minutes with time on including time on worth of football and it's still considered one of the greatest grand finals of all time you don't need i i'm i don't want to hear oh it's too low scoring oh i want to hear don't want to hear oh it's like a soccer match i don't want to hear any of that nonsense because like you said it was tough. It was physical. And it's the sort of game, again, it was decided on the last kick of the game. It was a four-point game in the end. It was either team's game at the end. The score could have been 65 to 61, and it still would have had at the end. I mean, who cares what it was? Mm -hmm. Like you said, 
both of these teams really, really, and you mentioned Press Pacas. You know, how is she going to play this season? I mean, this is really, I think, a kind of a kind of a do or die season for her in terms of how they as the two McDonald's played well as well. Um, you know, Richmond, Mon Conti played Mon Conti best on the ground for them as always, and she played absolutely fantastically. Uh, Sarah Hosking and they're both Hosking sisters played played particularly well. Sarah Hosking played with all the possessions that she got. This is not indicative, and 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 again, this is the sort of game that brings out the knuckle draggers and say, "Oh, this is uh, like 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 they scored twenty six more more points than they did sitting on the couch." That's what I have to say about that. <laughs> I love it, but but it's a character building win, I think, for Geelong, a team that really has kind of you know is, we're still waiting for them to have that good. We've been talking about them in the in two years and three years, they'll have a promising season. It's a grinded out victory. It's four points nonetheless. And now they have to take that the rest of the way. I mean, they're going to have to deal with a hobbled Fremantle team next week on the road. They might go to two and oh. I mean, we'll talk about that in a minute. But I mean, I think I think this is the sort of thing that even though again it's a four point victory, they only scored two goals, but a win's a win. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you got to be you got to be on top of when the final siren goes. So it just Georgie Pasparkas. The, the, the my favorite part was the announcer going, "I don't think she's got enough," and then for her to bury it at least eight meters up into the goal, up and through up through the goal through the goalpost, and absolutely loses her mind celebrating. That was absolutely fantastic. And then I got to give a shout out an overage rookie that I think played sensational in this game is Eile, Eilish Sharon. Holy, mm-hmm. she was everywhere in this game. She played absolutely fantastic. 19 disposals, five marks, four tackles. Absolutely incredible game by the by the by the rookie there. So uh, a huge shout out. And again, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this game. I I I, I was gripped and I kind of knew the school, I kind of knew who was who who won but I didn't know how. So I was super excited to watch this game. So absolutely incredible round of footy and a great kind of sealer for this round here so absolutely fantastic so we we, we jump from there we're, we're, we're going to kind of grab a little bit of those th- those that watch this that, that watch the men's reviews ross loves his oddball segments and he loves this one called fill in the blank so i thought i'd snag it i thought i'd snag it for this episode and we're going to test brian we're going to see what he thinks of this so i'm going to ask you the first fill in the blank it could be at the end it could be in the middle it could be at the start Here's your first question. The answer is Mount Vesuvius. Go ahead. (laughs) The most impressive win this round was by who? Oh, goodness. Um, um, Well, let's look. Um, I'm going to say, I'm going to say West Coast. I think they're, you know, they're, mind you, they played, again, they played an expansion Port Adelaide team, but, you know, as we said, this season, you know, they, they probably, you know, a year ago, they probably lose this game. So I, I think they, I think this is, I think they probably, for me, that was the most impressive victory. I think honorable mention goes to Essendon. I think if Essendon was playing an established team, that would probably be it. Um, you know, it's a good victory. I think Essendon's going to go pretty far, but I would say I would give the nod to West Coast. All righty. I, I, great one. And for me, I, I, for me, if I, if, if I did this, I would probably, I have to say Melbourne a little bit because that was an impressive to go on the road Yes, it was at Glendale. Yeah. It wasn't at Norwood. So a, a little bit differently. So I think it was a little more even. But uh, Melbourne, impressive victory. Go on the road. You beat you beat the defending premiers. Not a bad thing. So this is, uh, for a player, blank had the biggest impact on their team's win last round. Oh, goodness. Um, hmm. I can go real quick if you want to think about yeah, it a little go bit for longer. It. Yeah, Georgie this is going to this is gonna Georgie Persparkis. She she kicks both she kicks both the goals for her team. If she doesn't do that, who knows how this final score was in? So I, I, it's hard not to say that Georgie Prasparkis did not have the biggest impact to help her team win. So I'm going to give it to Georgie Georgie P on that one. Uh, I'm going to say I'm going to say Kate Shearlar. I uh, Shearlar. I think um, you know she's always been a really good player, and again, I think she's been you know she's been a good player on a, on a team that really has struggled. But, um, you know, she really has kind of come to the fore in this game. And I, and again, I'm picking a team where an established team being an expansion team. But, 
you know, I mean, she, this is what she's capable of. She's capable of of playing well in the playing well in the forward line, and you could see that when you get her the ball, she's she's good for scoring. So I'm gonna, I'd give the nod to Sheilar. Sheilar. All righty. Yep, and, and definitely not a bad one. So, and this will be a great kind of lead in to the to the ending part of our podcast here. The one game is blank. I'm looking forward to this round. Oh, um. <laughs> Well, let's see. I'm gonna t- I'm gonna say it's the first game. I'm gonna say it's Melbourne and North Melbourne. <laughs> um, uh, was that the right answer? There, there's there's no right answer. There's no right answer there. I mean, I mean, we could. I mean, we could each be Homerish and go, "Hey, it's our team. It's with Hawthorne. With Hawthorne, it's St Kilda. With Sydney, it's Collingwood." So, but no, I agree. I agree with you. This this North Melbourne Melbourne game, I think, I w- would be the one I would say just because for me, this is this is North Melbourne as legitimate as we think they might be and is Melbourne as dominant as we think they might be because if North comes out if 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 Melbourne comes out and smacks North Melbourne it's almost kind of be like how we talked about the men's team earlier this season was is that is is our other teams going to be playing for second place in the grand final to Melbourne or is North Melbourne going to kind of put a little bit of a spanner in the works when it comes to who we think is going to win the flag at the end of the year well, I think I think both teams are are. I mean, we've been waiting for for North Melbourne to make the deep run. You know, ever since they came into the league and they were able to snap up Emma Kearney and they were able to snap up some of these other, you know, Jazzy Garner, uh, you know, Jess Duffin. When they were able to get all, all these players, they were, you know, it was almost people were saying it was almost unfair that they could build such a team from the beginning, and yet we've not seen them make the deep run. This, I think, will kind of test them to play at uh, – they're playing at Casey Fields, I believe. No, it's, uh, at, it's at the MCG oh, now. Oh, this is the one at the MCG. That's correct. No, uh, it's a, it's an unfamiliar – it's an unfamiliar uh, – that's right, because we were just talking about it. It's an unfamiliar ground. It's a big ground. Um, so it's going to test them, I think. It's going to test them pretty well. It's really going to test both teams. I think Melbourne might have the edge. If I had to say, and I know we're talking about this first game now, and and but I w- I would definitely say that I mean if anything it's going to be good, and I think there's going to be plenty of room for both teams, uh, on that massive ground. Yeah, for sure. So I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it, sir. I know I've done it so many times. I will hand you my soapbox. Go on ahead. We, what we were what we were talking about before we hopped on Mike, how irritated. I mean, because I know you and I have had this discussion many, many times. How irritated are you that I, I understand that this game got moved? I do. I don't like that it's a curtain raiser because I think it it I think it stifles what the women are really doing. I understand that there's there's talking heads in the footy media that think this is the best thing for the women's competition, and you you heard my rant, so I will I will I will bequeath you my soapbox, sir. Please have at it because. <laughs> Uh, it is nice of you to wash it before before giving it to me. I, I appreciate that. Um, no, um, the so there's a couple of reasons why I don't think because because that's the thing. Everybody says, oh well, we'll just have them play as curtain raisers. One to me, curtain raisers. It's kind of like back in the day when in the men's game when reserves matches were played as curtain raisers, kind of as kind of as a as a you know a lead into it. To me. A, a a curtain raiser means that it's you know in this case it's because it's the reserves and the reserves feed into the seniors in the men's side to me that would show that the women's game is subservient to the men's game mm-hmm. and it isn't and i don't want to hear about the men's game propping up the women's game i don't want to hear any of that nonsense because the women have been stifled and have been tamped down you know they've been disallowed to play. They've been allowed to be on the on the sidelines, and they've been allowed to you know work all the other menial things, but they haven't been allowed to play for decades. They deserve every little bit of. They deserve to stand on their own. They deserve every concession that they get. They deserve every dollar that the AFL is willing to give them. So get out of here with this prop up nonsense. They are not subservient to that. Number one. Number two. No North Melbourne fan is going to pay that much money to not watch their team. There is no reason, you know, we're, you know, do I think that that AFLW games should, should, 
be ticketed and should should cost this amount of money? Absolutely. Is it worth paying a hundred dollars for a or whatever it is for a round two game? Absolutely not. And you're freezing the North Melbourne fans out, and a team that has consistently been one of the better teams in AFLW and who is very well supported fan wise. And you're going to freeze them out for what? There's nobody. I don't know of that many people that are going to come and watch even most of the game. So maybe they sneak in a little bit in the fourth quarter. I use this this example for somebody and, and it's a little bit different, but they were holding curtain raisers for the AFL, for the AFL international cup ahead of AFL, AFL games in, in 2017, you know, both of those games had 30, 40,000 people. I would say 2%, 3% of that, of that were there. And mind you, Maybe a little apples and oranges. Mm-hmm. How many people are going to want to go to go there early? This is a 5 p.m. start on a Friday. A 5 p.m. start on a Friday. Who's going to want to go and spend from 5 p.m. all the way through to, to 10 p.m.? Mm-hmm. The amount of people that are willing to do that from the very beginning to the very end. And what happens if this game's a blowout? They're going to show up. They're going to come and see that the game has completely been out of it. It's a terrible, it's an awful idea. These games should be nowhere near the men's games. Absolutely nowhere near the men's games. You did this so that it would have free, so that it would have clear air and it would stand on its own. Let them do it. And, 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 and don't let, and for the love of God, if this decision came from above Nicole Livingston's head, which it probably did, Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I mean, the, the AFLW has to AFLW has to stand on its own. It can't be can't like the only thing that I could see that is worthwhile there being an association is is the clubs is the fact that all the clubs are are essentially one club. There should be no reason why this game is being played at the MCG. Absolutely none, and it needs to stop. And or somebody saying, "Oh, they should do a, a, a at the grand final. They should do it an AFLW game as a curtain raiser for a grand final." Because well, there's going to be a hundred thousand people at the grand final. Again, I would say at most one percent of that. Which again, talking a thousand people are going to want to come, even if that's even if that's ten thousand people. It's a fifth of what, not for a regular season. I wouldn't even say for a for a for a for a playoff game, for a grand final, something like that. Keep it away from the men's game. It needs to grow on its own. It needs to germinate on its own. Stop comparing it to the men's game. Stop associating with the men's game. Let it grow on its own. If people, you want to put it a couple of hours, you want to hell, you want to have a game at Punt Road. Have a game at Punt Road mm-hmm. that ends, you know, let them let them start at 10 o'clock on grand final day. Let them start at 9 o'clock on grand final day. I'm sure the women won't mind playing at 9 a.m. That way you have, if you want to go and watch the game, you can watch it. You can walk across Jollymont and go to the MCG and watch the grand final. It's the same thing here. Have a game, have it stand on its own. Give the fans plenty of time to go from one to the other if that's what they want to do. Don't force them to 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 for 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 the perceived bigger audience that's not going to be there. Well, and, and as we discussed a little bit too, uh, and I've noticed this in a big time, the AFLW crowd and the AFL crowd are are different. And, and and as much as people don't want to accept it, it is the AFLW crowd is a far different kind of segment of of footy fans than the afl m is so you can't compare it it's it it is not apples to apples it is apples to bananas it is apples to pineapples here Mm -hmm. it is just not the same we cannot do that and i'm sick and tired of hearing pundits say that the exposure that they'll get at the mcg before the grand final will be good no it won't because there is no exposure you are not getting exposure from the men's game you just aren't accept it people it is not the same it is not the 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 fans that are going to want to go to that final game between melbourne and sydney are honestly and again i hate saying it but it's true they don't give two flying you know what's about the women's game 
They're coming yeah. to the men's game. If they get the end of the fourth quarter, so be it. But they're not going to invest. They're not going to go, oh, this looks awesome. I'm going to go. No. No. They're there for that. Yeah, they're there for that final. They're there for that final only. And I'm not disrespecting men's. I'm not disrespecting the men's core it's fans. Two different, it's two different but it, audiences. But they're just, they, many of them are just not interested. You cannot try to, as the knuckle draggers as you say shove it down their throats and this is one of the ways that they can make that complaint which only exacerbates the problem the aflw and its fans have with the men's game is that it shadows them when it can't it will not yes. grow if the men's game is the reason that everybody uses the excuse that they are growing it's not the no. women's is a growth area that the afl dub afl knows the women is their growth area. They are running low. This it, it's the all it's everybody's complaining about Tasmania. We don't have enough talent. I'll sit here and tell you this right now. The women's are going to grow in talent because of the 600, 300, 400% growth in youth girls footy. So if you want to expand, the women is actually where your expansion is coming is going to grow from because you've got a, a ton, a ton more young, talented girls that are going to come up and join this league than men right now. And it's one thing that it's frustrating to see as for it. And I know we're a couple, we're a couple of guys, but we love this. We love oh, yeah. this competition. We have friends that work in this competition. We have friends mm -hmm. that play in this competition. Mm -hmm. We have friends that cover this competition that is we, why we are, we are so invested. visceral about this we are we are invested because the other thing is is that if forget forget <clears throat> that you and i are you know as you said we know people we know people who play over there we know people in the grassroots i mean donnie you've done such fantastic work in des moines with the roosters with you know emily rice and everybody else who's done such great job you know, I've worked with a lot of the women who some of whom have gone over there and who have played state level football. The argument, one of the worst arguments that I saw online was that the money that is being wasted, and I'm using air quotes here, the money that is being wasted on expanding and 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 playing this AFLW competition could be used to save clubs in country footy country footy clubs or local footy clubs no and i'll tell you why because what this does is this gives because now there is a pathway all of these clubs who years and years ago didn't have anything above u12 for the women's now you can have a full-on women's competition. You can mm -hmm. have a U six fourteen, a U sixteen, and a U eighteen. You could have, you could have a a, a, a fantastic. Uh, I'll give you a great example, I guess, of, of something like this. Um, a good friend of mine, Talia Sinclair, plays. Uh, she and her partner live in um, in uh, Ningen, which is in country New South Wales. An hour and a half she drives to Dubbo because that's the closest that they have. And she plays in a four-team competition. Now, you might say, oh, that's a four-team competition. That's really nothing. But these are country clubs in the middle of nowhere in New South Wales where they all play rugby league. Now, these clubs have this, this extra... They have, and some of them have a second women's team, and some of them have a lot of these other things. And I think about some of the some of the other people I know that play. It has nothing to do with with you know the, the people are worried. People who have nothing, who have no stake financially in AFL and the AFL, are worried that they're losing money because of this. No, it, it's it's and 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 the point of that of, of of that Donnie is to say this: the people who are making these suggestions are people who don't watch AFLW on a regular basis and mm -hmm. who are mostly invested in the men's game, and so they're coming from a men's growth mentality, and you can't have that. Mm -hmm. uh, I 100%. think that's the big. 
I think that's the big that's the biggest thing. So and that's, that's and that's the yeah. most frustrating too. It's it's like it's like I un, I under I understand you have a vested interest, but when your vested interest blinds you to what you're actually talking about, it just makes you look ignorant. And it, and it, yeah. and, I, and I don't I don't like going on and attacking these people, but I do just want to ask. I'm like, do you? I actually, do. Like my my first question always to them is, do you actually watch it? Because as soon as they say no, I could say, well, how do you know what you're talking about? So I just, I, I, I don't like, I don't like feeding fuel for some of these people because it's, it's just, it's, it's the worst possible thing. So now that we've had our, we've both had our yeah. soapbox moment, it's absolutely great. Let, let's jump into it. I, I, I want to be, I, I've done it in the men. So I'm going to do it in the women's and I, this is, this has been so fantastic for me, my team of the week. And I'm hoping Ross can get me the, the write out so I can get this, put it up on posted online. I think this would be fantastic. So I always start with defense. I'm a coach. So I always start with defense starting off. I, I can't not go it. Yeah. She played in the midfield, but I'm going to put her in one of my defensive spots calling with Ruby slicer, incredible game by her. Absolutely. Fantastic. Got to get her in the team. Adelaide's Chelsea Randall again, Taylor Harris's kryptonite. And she played like it 17 disposals. Absolutely. Fantastic game by the veteran Adelaide Crows defender port port Adelaide's Indy Tahu. I think she played really, really well for port again, uh, she kind of had a little bit more to do as the game kind of went on as West coast really started to drive um, towards that wind there. So got to give her um, Richmond's Eilish Sharon, as I said earlier, absolutely fantastic debut. Absolutely fantastic. And Brian, I'm going to warm your heart. Ready for this? Essendon's Danny Marshall is going to be my last defender in. She moved up and kicked a goal. That always is one of my indicators to put you. If you were a defender and can kick a goal that automatically makes an impact, I'm going to put her in. Congratulations, Danny. To the midfield, I mean, it, it's it's the who's who. Adelaide's Ann Hatchard, again. I mean, it's Ann Hatchard. It, it's hard not to argue. Norse Jasmine Garner, again, Jazzy Garner. I mean, self-explanatory. Essendon's Maddie Prosparkus again, helping her Essendon team get a big win. You can't not argue it. We discussed her in the game earlier, Brisbane's Orla or Dwyer kicking two goals for her. And last but not least, when you kick a game winner, you got to be in my team of the week. Georgie Prosparkus of the Geelong Cats doing the rock is Carlton's Bree Moody. You kick a goal as a, as a rock, as, as a rock, you, you got to be in my team of the week. We go to forwards. A little bit more difficult sometimes in the women's games because you don't get as many goals scored, but we had some good goal scorers here. Adelaide's Ash Woodland, three goals. Talia Randall from the North North Melbourne Rose, three goals. St. Kilda's Kate Sheilor, four goals. Bonnie Too Good, two goals. And the wonder that is Cora Staunton as GWS. I jumped to the bench and because the women have five bench players, I have a utility player. So my defender is Meg McDonald from Geelong. Absolutely incredible performance by Meg. Absolutely fantastic. The Ruck, Richmond's Gabrielle Seymour. She played really, really well for them. I think she really kind of made a big impact. Um, the midfielder, Fremantle's Haley Miller. I, I know they were they were under they were underwomaned, but Haley played an incredible game. Forward is Brisbane's Courtney Hotter one of several that had two goals in this game, but I got to give Courtney the nod here. And then just because she can go a little bit of everywhere on the ground is Sarah Hosking from the Richmond Tigers is my utility. And that is my 21 team of the round for round one of the AFLW. So an incredible team, fantastic to go on a little bit harder to look up some of the statistics on this one, but I had an absolute blast doing this team of the round. So keep an eye out. I will do a team of the round each and every round for the year. We've come to it, sir. We've come to the tips round two. Let's jump right into it. I mean, we've already talked the, it's head off Melbourne, North Melbourne, MCG. Who do you like? I like the demons. I think they are suited for the bigger field. I think they're bigger. They're better suited. They might even be some, they might even actually have, have a home crowd that might want to see at least a game and a half of this. Uh, I say the demons by, uh, by two goals. And I have the D's on this one. I think, I think around that one, I actually have them with three goals. I think that they're just going to have a little too much. And the last time they played in a big stadium, they can put up a big score when they really want to. We jump over to the Swinburne Center as Richmond hosts the Adelaide Crows. First time these two teams have ever played. I'm fascinated to see how Mon Conti does against the star-studded midfield of Ev Marinoff and Ann Hatchard. I just think Adelaide has a little too much, but I'm fascinated to see how Ellie McKenzie and Mon Conti match up against Ev Marinoff and Ann Hatchard. Who do you like in this one? 
I think this will be competitive for about the first half, and then in the third quarter, the Crows pull away. Their midfield, I think, has too much class. I'm going to say the Crows by, we'll say by 26. All right, we jump over to the Alberton Oval as the Port Adelaide Port Adelaide Power get their first ever home game in South Australia as they host the Western Bulldogs in this. Who do you like in this one? This is tough. I think Port's, you know, Port's got a good side. I think the, the Bulldogs coming off of that that win uh, last week, I think, I think might have a little bit of steam. These are two pretty evenly matched teams. I'm going to say the Bulldogs by less than a goal at Alberton Oval. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna tip I'm gonna tip the dug the doggies in this one as well. I just I just think they're gonna have just a little too much, but I think Port's in this. I think it's gonna take a little bit to get that fitness up, but it's gonna be fantastic to see the Alberton Oval and to see how the Port faithful come and support their women's team. We jump out, stay going, keep keep going further west to the Fremantle Oval as Fremantle hosts the Geelong Cats. And here's where, at least in the tipping, it's a little bit of an upset for most people at the start of the season. I like the Cats in this one. I think the, I think with Fremantle's injuries and some of the issues that they're running into, I know the Cats have had issues scoring, but just Fremantle has been absolutely savaged by injuries. I, I'm, I'm thinking the Cats will find a way to nip one out on the West. Yeah, I think this will be a this will be a close game. We might even see one come down to the end again. But I think the cat. I think you're right, Donnie. I think spot on. I think I think that this is not the same Fremantle team that we've seen in the last couple of years. And 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 the Cats, they're going from one side of the. You know, they're going from they're going from winning at, at ho- winning against Richmond to now coming out to the West Coast. I think they win this one. I still think this will be in the one goal range, but mm-hmm. I I can't see them. I I I don't know that they can that that Fremantle can get up over them even at home. Yeah, it'll be it'll be very very interesting. Let's jump let's jump over next game. We have the Essendon Bombers. They get their test. This is their test here. Essendon, Carlton. Who do you like in this one? I'm going to say the Bombers, and I think as we said, I think Carlton. I think this will be a competitive game. Um, again, I think maybe a year ago, I think Carlton. I think Carlton definitely loses this one. But I I think we look at we look at how well they've played against Collingwood. I think they're a good side. But this is going to be, like you said, I think this is going to be Essendon's first test. I think a lot of people were saying that their VFL success is going to carry over. And one thing we didn't mention coming into this year, Georgia Nance gone, unfortunately. Their captain is out for the mm. season, and I, which, is, which is a shame, uh, suffering that ACL injury in the, uh, in the grand final win in really in garbage time. They'd already had the win salted away. But I think that they're, I think I like Essendon. I think they're a little bit more balanced. I think they're a little bit more talented up and down the park. I think this is probably going to be somewhere around a two goal victory, but I like the Bombers. I think, I think this is a winnable game for them at home. See, for me, I'm I'm a little bit the opposite. I'm I'm a little worried that Essendon's strong performance was a little bit of Marvel Stadium and playing the Hawks, which I think I think the Hawks had a little bit of a lot of firepower to kind of handle there. And they they were kind of they went a little younger in some areas, a little more experienced in some, and the bombers kind of nipped them. I'm gonna go Carlton here. I think Bree Moody, Mimi Hill, and I think Darcy Vessio has a big game. I think she kicks two or three in this game, and I think she I think they break it open for the Carlton Blues. So I think the Blues are going to, I'm going to tip the Blues in this one. We jump over Victoria Park, Collingwood, Sydney. As much as I would love to tip my swans, Collingwood looked really, looked pretty good against a a Carlton team that I think, I think it's going to be sneaky a little bit better than some people thought. Uh, I think Collingwood just a little too much talent. I think Sydney's in it for the first half, second half fade a little bit. Can they just play good defense and keep it close? So I think Collingwood, Collingwood win this one, but I think it's a little bit closer than some people think. Yeah, I'm with you on this one. I think I, it's going to be competitive. It's, it's, Sydney's going to be competitive during the course of the season. They've got mm-hmm. a good side. I think I think it's going to take a year for them to actually build up into a, into a finals caliber team. Mm-hmm. Collingwood is in form. I think the Magpies win this one. All right, we jump up out to Manuka Oval, and unfortunately, here we go. GWS, here's the Brisbane Lions coming off that scintillating win over the Fremantle Dockers. Who do you like in this one? I like Brisbane. 
I think I think this will be much closer. I don't think I don't think Brisbane will blow them off the park the way that they blew out that they blew out the Dockers. But I think that this I think they're a good. Uh, you know, when you we talked about all those players, we talked about their forward line. GWS's defense is pretty good. This could see some offensive fireworks between all those forwards that the Lions have and players like Cora Staunton, who I think will go off. And as good as the defense has been for the Lions, I think that they've you know that that Staunton can give them a fair bit of trouble. But I think the Lions win this one again. Pretty, I think this will be a very tight game from beginning to end. Elise Parker, Emily Bates is, an, is, is a mouth-watering matchup to see how those two absolute elite superstars play against. I, I agree with you. I think Brisbane just got a little too much. GWS is in it. I think they make this a competitive game. I think Brisbane's class and, and the, the firepower that they have just is just a tiny bit too much. Jump to Box Hill Oval as Hawthorne get their first home game of the season as they take on the St. Kilda Saints. I'm I'm going a little bit on the upset here. I think the Saints, I liked what I saw. I, I think they, they get another they get another kind of perfect matchup for them, another expansion team that, that kind of faded a little bit in that first game. The the Greiser, Shelor kind of front half, I think, may give some of that shorter Hawthorne defense a little bit of issues. And Georgia Patricios being back in her her, her class and, and Ali McKinnon and, and Rock I think played really really well so I, I like I think I like St. Kilda in this one. The Hawks fan set, agrees with you on this one. I, <laughs> I I will tell you no I I, I listen I think Hawthorne's gonna is gonna be as just like Sydney I think they've got some good talent I think they're gonna be good in a season or so once they have a season under their belt and maybe once some of these younger players they have and I'll tell you what this is the uh, the Tilly Lucas Rod Bowl because uh, <laughs> she played for uh, yeah <laughs> she played for uh, Saint see uh, for Saint Kilda and come across and she is the captain. Uh, she's at least sitting in the captain's role for the for the Hawthorne Hawks. I've been very impressed with her, but I think I think you're right. I think I think with Shula with Shula uh, coming off of this huge game, and I think Hawthorne again still kind of finding their feet, even at home at Box Hill Oval. And of course, we have to give a shout out to our friends at the Outer Sanctum, uh, the Race Sisters, and and the rest who really have have worked hard to get to this point. They're finally going to get to see uh their 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 hawks play at home at the aflw level after so many years uh so uh i i'm like them of course i'm a hawk supporter i my heart says i would like to see them win but i think i think st kilda prop wins this one and again i think this is going to be a, a very close game at the end yeah i think it'll be, a fa- it'll be a fascinating game to watch and last but not least up in metricon stadium gold coast West Coast, a, a game that last year had was absolutely scintillating towards the end. Um, I think I, I like what I saw from West Coast. The travel to the Gold Coast, the ground travel to the Gold Coast may be interesting, but I, I, I like West Coast here. I think surprisingly they've gelled really quickly for what seems like an almost brand new team with all of the additions from last year's squad. And I just think the loss of Sarah Perkins is much, much more damaging to the Gold Coast than I think we originally thought. So I, I like the West Coast Eagles in this one. I, I it's amazing. We've agreed on every pick except for except for one. <laughs> um, no, I, I'm I'm with you. I think the you know the travel to have to travel from one side of the country to the other is very difficult, no matter what the sport, and especially in a situation like this where, you know, where where the West where West Coast basically has to travel for half their schedule. Um, but I. I, I'm I was very impressed by them. I'm I'm I think this is like I said when when we were talking about their match. I think Gold Coast is I think this is going to be a long season for them. I think that they that they really haven't had that that presence up front. They lost with Perko. Um, so I, I say West Coast wins this game. It'll be competitive. I think it'll be just as competitive as it was last time out. But I I, I think the Eagles will get the edge here. Yeah, I think it's it'll be a fantastic game. And another good round, another good round of footy of the year. A uh, nine great games again. It's so awesome to say nine games and all eighteen teams have it. So I, I think that is going to do it for our episode. Brian, as usual, absolutely fantastic to have you on again. Another ally when it comes to women's footy in in the in the media situation here. And I know that uh, you and I are both. We're getting to that. To- we're getting to that point of the year. We're getting closer and closer to USAFL Nationals. How how excited are you for this? So um, I will. I've got my tickets set for my plane flight. I will be in California. I cannot wait. 
I will be there too. I will be there way, 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 way too early in the morning. I think I've got a, I think I've got a, uh, I've got a 5 a.m. flight out to California that Thursday morning. I don't know what the hell I was thinking, but uh, no, um, this is a very, very, this is going to be a, an incredibly special tournament, Donnie. Uh, this is, as I don't know how many uh, folks know, but this is the 25th anniversary of the United States Australia Football League. And at Nationals uh, on the Thursday night, we'll be holding a 25th anniversary gala, uh, which uh, tickets are still on sale. If you're going to be out there and uh, you want to have a delicious meal and then watch uh, the history of the USAFL unfold before the very screens um it's going to be a lot of fun i think the entire weekend is going to be fun and since we're talking about the women's competition i think we're going to see the women's competition in the usafl bounce back um you know we only had five teams across uh everybody last year we had three full teams and we had two mixed teams i think we're looking at having at least eight teams across the board which is good to see there's talk there's some questions as to whether or not it's going to be in one division uh, still or whether they're going to go back to the two division format that we had uh prior in 2019 um you know I, I, just to kind of give you an idea you know the san francisco iron maidens have won five championships in a row the uh current record holders of the Denver Bulldogs who won the previous six before that. So we might see a record tied this year. And with the amount of players that they have, and we talk about VFLW and Australia connections, uh, Katie Klatt, who played for Melbourne University a couple of years ago when they were in VFLW. And then you have uh, the prospect of uh, Jess Blecker, who played for Collingwood when they won the grand final. She wasn't in the grand final team, but she played for them in that season. And then they have a, a, a picked up a player by the name of Leilani Silvio from Denver. It always seems like you like every year when you're when you want to write them out, they they come in. But don't count out. Again, the Denver Bulldogs defending runners up from a season ago. The Seattle Grizzlies have a full team once again. The runners up from 2018 and 2019. New York's going to come hungry as they always do. DC Eagles prove that they could play a Division One. Uh, we might see a, a a good team come out of Sacramento, who's played really well. They beat a combined San Francisco Denver team. Uh, in San Francisco uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago. So they might be competitive. There's a lot of question marks with a lot of division two teams, but I think we're going to see, I think we're going to see a very, very competitive. And I think the entire season is going to be competitive. The entire competition is going to be competitive. I don't have any sort of information in terms of streaming yet. We hope to get that finalized in the next couple of weeks. If you're in Australia, uh, if you're able to follow along by all means, um, it should be on because we're on the West Coast, it should be on pretty early in the morning at the end of it. Um, so uh, if you get a chance to watch, it's the weekend of October 15th and 16th uh, in 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 uh, Ontario, California. Yeah, I cannot wait. I've been telling you, any any Aussie that knows, I said, if you can get to California, I said, it's in Ontario. I, I said, it wouldn't be too far a jaunt if you can get to LAX. So super excited. So that is going to be our episode, a jam-packed round one. Keep an eye out. Round two will be out very soon. Let's go women's footy. We will see you again next week.